Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to Faith Community Online, wherever you're at today. As you listen to the message, let us know what you think in the comments, like if something stands out to you, if something inspires you or even challenges you, we would love to hear about it. At the end of the message, there will be a few details about how you can connect at Faith Community and take your next steps on your own personal journey with God. Thanks so much for being here. Now let's dive in. Well, whether you're on site today or watching online, we're excited that we can worship together and be in this service together. My name is Mark Cox. I'm uh, just here preaching today, filling in for Pastor Josh. I grew up here at the church, uh, was raised in this area, I was on staff here for a while, and uh, have now been gone for several years pastoring and now work for a faith-based missions organization out of Springfield, Missouri. So it's just always an honor to be back. You might know my parents, Harvey and Kathy Cox. They're somewhere in the building today. So if you know them, I'm related to them. I have known them nearly my whole life. The first few years are a little fuzzy, but the rest uh, makes sense. My beautiful wife, Trisha, also grew up in the church. She's here. We have two kids. Yeah, I like her too. Uh, I had two kids. My son, Jonathan, is 22, married, and they just moved to Fort Worth, Texas uh, to take up some jobs there. And my daughter just dropped her off at, high school, or at uh, college this past Monday. So uh, everybody's asking, how do we feel about empty nesting? And we said, we're only a week in. We'll let you know. So uh, we're looking forward to that, but it's a great day to be here. If you have a Bible or the Bible app, just turn to Luke chapter 10. That's where we're going to read today. And as you're turning there, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read the Bible, and especially when I read stories in the Bible, how many of you know the stories in the Bible are real? They're not like fictitious stories that someone made up. They're real life things. And as I read some of those stories sometimes, uh, when I think of like David and, and Esther and any other big story that could stand out to you, I often think to myself, these people are amazing, right? Like they have it together. They, they are having such a big God moment in that story. But then I usually flip over to another narrative in my mind, which is kind of like this, but I'll probably never have a moment like this because I'm not that big a deal. I'm just a simple, normal person. They get to have big moments with God, but I probably will never have those moments because I'm just an average guy. Does anybody else ever have that thought every now and then? I think that's kind of a thought that rattles around in our head, but as I've read these scriptures, as I look at these stories, and as I regularly continue to go through the Bible and just see what God is saying, what I realized is this. Those people had no idea in that moment that that was a big God moment. They really didn't. They didn't know what was going on. They just thought they were having an average day and things got a little weird. How many of you have had an average day and things got a little weird, right? And sometimes we're like, well, I don't want the weird. Well, sometimes something weird happens, like in these stories, and they didn't realize what was going on, but how they responded in the moment, in their big moment, is the reason why we're still talking about that story today. And so what I want to do today is just challenge us to realize that God has created you and I for big moments. He's created us for big moments. You say, what do you mean by a big moment? I would say it's more those daily encounters where God does something supernatural in your life. Now, when I say big moment, it doesn't have to be a big thing or a small thing. I'm not talking about the size. I'm simply talking about the moment of encounter when God does something so real in our lives that we just go, wow, that was Amazing. Now, one of the words I used in that phrase was the word supernatural. All of us, I think, want God to do something supernatural in our lives. But we need to understand that that singular word is made up of two words, natural and super. How many of you know sometimes we've got to do the basic day-to-day -day natural stuff so that a super God can come in and empower the natural? We're often waiting for God to open the doors and knock down the doors, and he's saying, would you just get close to the door first? right? But, well, when you open it, I'll get there. He's like, nope, when you get there, I'll open it. And so we look at that today. And so as we look at uh, Luke chapter 10, I want to look at one simple event. I can't tell you what your big moment will look like, but I can tell you that God created you for big moments. I don't know what your big moment will look like. I can't promise you that it's going to be this huge healing. I can't promise it's going to be this windfall of cash you know, that, that you prayed for and it finally came. I can't tell you that, but all I can tell you is this. As we prepare for the big moments, we will experience the big moments. And as we get ready for them, God will do something in those situations that might forever change our lives and may even change the lives of the people around us simply because we were ready for God 
to have his moment through us. So as we read today, I'll make a few observations. We'll tell a few stories and we'll have some fun. How many of you are okay with having fun at church? Awesome. So let's start with this. I'm gonna start with a simple survey. If you were to invite someone to your house, you have two answers here. Which one would you do? A, would you prep and clean like crazy? Or B, would you just let things stay as they are and just let them come over as it is? If you're an A person, you're gonna prep and clean like crazy. Raise your hand. Yes, there you go. All right, I'm coming to your house. That's right. And then those of you who said, no, I'm just gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave the underwear on the ceiling fan. That's where it was. That's just how it is. That's where it landed. I'm out, okay? Well, I can tell you this. In my house, my wife is the prepper. She's gonna clean and get it ready and wipe everything down. I mean, she, I mean, the counters have to be wiped. The floors have to be mopped and vacuumed. The towels have to be folded. Every toilet needs to be clean. The shower, not just our, I mean, the bathroom of the house next door has to be clean if we're having guests come over. Now, she's typically that way all the time, so I'm not gonna complain. I am the beneficiary of a clean house. Any gentleman with a clean house, just say amen. That's right. Well, no clean houses, Will. Okay. <laughs> but others, they're, they're just kind of crazy and run around. I'm kind of like, I want it to be nice, but I don't want to stress out about it. I don't want to freak out about it. I want to take the time to enjoy the people that are coming. Well, that scenario plays big into the story that we're about to read because we're going to focus on the story today of Mary. Uh, the Bible says she's Mary of Bethany. She is the sister of uh, Martha and Lazarus. You may have heard them in their story, Lazarus, the guy that died, and Jesus raised him back from the dead. And not only are we going to read their story, their first initial introduction to Jesus, but we're also going to see one of their awkward family fights. Does anyone in the room ever have an awkward family fight? How many of you believe other people cause those fights? How many of you think you might actually cause that fight? How many of you just going to stay silent on the thing because there's people around that you don't want them to see your response? I get it. Well, we're going to have a little window into that today, and we're going to start right at the beginning of the story in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, and it starts this way. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village. We know that village is Bethany, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. So when we pick up the story, we see that Jesus is traveling. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He has his 12 disciples with them. And as they pass through Bethany, Bethany's a town that's a mile and a half before they get to Jerusalem. As they're passing through, they're greeted by Martha in the city square or the village square. And she greets them and she invites them to her home. Now, when we look at this story, we're left to understand that Martha is inviting them to their family home where she lives with her brother and her sister all together in this home. It's also believed that this is the very first time that anyone in this family has had personal physical contact with Jesus. This is their first encounter. Now that doesn't mean they didn't know who Jesus was because we already know the stories of Jesus are circulating everywhere. In fact, prior to this event, Jesus has already healed lepers. He's already cured paralytic and raised a boy and girl from to, back to life. He's cast out demons at this point. He's healed the woman with the issue of blood. He has fed the 4,000 and the 5,000 at this point. So let's just say his stories are being told. But this is their first interaction with him. And it's probably why Martha, when she sees him in the street and realizes these 12 other guys following around, she goes, this is the guy. And I want to see if he'll come to my house for dinner. Now, with all that context in mind, and I love biblical context, there are some oddities in this story, some weird little things that maybe we, we glaze over. First oddity is this, is that Martha even addressed Jesus in public. In that day, I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying that the culture of that day was that women didn't uh, begin the conversation in public with a strange man. That's just what it was in that day. It was actually inappropriate for a woman to do that in that day. That was the first oddity. The second oddity is even odder, and that's she invited him to her home. So if it's weird enough for her to address him in public, it's even more weird for her to invite him to her home for obvious reasons. And if you don't understand the obvious reasons, let me explain it to you. In that day, there were other ladies who also congregated in the city square who invited men to their home. And because we have kids in the room today, I'll stop there because I think you understand it wasn't for dinner. Okay, And so it was odd that she would invite him 
to her house. It's just odd. But we know a big moment's coming because we know the end of the story. But what do we do with this oddity? I would say this as we consider not only their big moment, but the big moments that God has for you. This is an observation I make from this passage already. Some of your biggest moments will often feel odd at first. Some of the biggest moments that God wants to facilitate in your life will feel a little odd at first. Sometimes we avoid big moments because it doesn't feel right to us. And sometimes God doesn't really care about how I feel about it. How many of you know when God's trying to do something new in my life, I often feel weird about it? Because my way of doing things, while I think they're right, God looks at them and goes, mm, suspect at best, right? I've got some better ways for you to do things. And so at first, in this story, it's just, it's just odd. And sometimes the things that God wants to do in our lives feels a little odd at first. Now notice I didn't say wrong, just Odd. What do I mean? It means sometimes you may get the sense that God wants you to do something and you begin to ask, why is God asking me to do this? This just feels odd. Or you may be thinking to yourself in scenarios where you see a lot of stuff going on, but it doesn't make sense. And you're trying to see what is God doing in the background that I can't see right now? Or maybe you go, this just feels odd because I don't understand it. And if I don't understand it, I'm not going to do it. I just want to tell you today, if you have to understand what God's doing to obey God in it. You will never understand often in that moment. It requires a measure of trust and faith. Listen, I don't want a God who's small enough that I can understand. I want a God who's big and who sees the whole picture even when I only see one puzzle piece. And so if I have to understand it, it's just odd sometimes. We have to be ready to understand that sometimes God is going to lead us to a big moment that just feels a little odd at first. Then the story goes on in verse 39. They've already arrived at the home, and Martha had a sister named Mary. And Mary seated herself at the Lord's feet and was continually listening to his teaching. The Message Bible paraphrases it and says that she sat before Jesus hanging on every word that he said. I don't know if you've ever had a friend like this or a person that you admired like this, but I've had some people in my life that, that when they talked, I just liked to listen. Because if you would listen long enough, there was something to learn. They had wisdom. They had experience that I didn't have. There was just some of those people I just like to be around and just kind of glean whatever I can for however many moments I've got them there. I imagine Jesus was one of those guys. He was one of those guys that when you got a chance to be with him, you know, I, I don't think he was probably talking about sports scores, even though I think he was a real guy, you know, I believe. But I think he had deep things to say. And, and in this moment, we don't know exactly who Jesus is teaching or who he's talking to. We make the assumption that it's Lazarus that's sitting there maybe with them or it's the 12 disciples. But what we know for sure is this. On the front row, at his feet, Listening intently, focused, and undistracted is Mary. Just listening, just taking the moment to be in the presence of Jesus. And again, when I look at this story and I look at the context, based on some of the same oddities that we talked about earlier, this moment is a little odd. Why is it a little odd? Well, women in that day weren't usually part of these types of discussions. Um, culturally, and I'm going to say unfairly, unbiblically, they weren't invited. I don't think we should do that today. I believe God loves women just as much as men. Ladies, that was your chance. <laughs> and so, but culturally back then, in fact, women weren't leaders in that day for the most part. They weren't leaders. They weren't teachers. So the front row would have been reserved for somebody, anybody, other than Mary. And yet, with all the frustration and all the cultural faux pas that she's creating here, I can even imagine a few of the disciples, because we know they're, they were goofy sometimes and said dumb stuff. Can you imagine them over in the corner? What is she thinking? <laughs> Sitting in Jesus, in front of Jesus, that's my spot. She know who I am? Yet the only person in the room who did not have a problem with where Mary was, was who? Jesus. He had no problem with this young lady right where she was. 
And if you'd allow me to make another observation today about her big moment and potentially our big moments, it's this. Your big moments will often start in some of the oddest of places. Places that you wouldn't have thought God would do something big. Maybe places he's leading you to to go do that. Now, for everybody, that's different. I don't know what big thing God wants to do in your life. I don't know what the big moments. I don't even think God's created you for one moment. I think he's created us for a lifetime of moments where he moves and does something powerful. But I can give you a few examples of people I know and love. For 11 years, I pastored in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and uh, I had the opportunity of having people, woo yes, Lord, hallelujah, had people come and cheese. It's just about the cheese. That's all it is. But I had people come to me, uh, and I have two stories here. One young lady came to me. She had been run away home from home at age 13. Within a few months, she was abducted. She was uh, sexually assaulted and then stabbed over 20 times and left for dead. She survived. And she came to me one day, and, and we were meeting, and she said, Pastor, I'm, I feel like God might be, you know, I'm kind of putting some words together. God might have a moment for me here, but it's kind of in an odd place, and I don't know if I should do it. And I said, well, tell me, what is it? She said, well, you know, we have, we have three strip clubs in town, and I really get a sense that God wants me to go and somehow engage the women that are a part of that and just remind them that they have value that's greater than what they're doing today or what they've experienced in the past and that there's hope and healing from whatever their hurt is. She said, that seems odd, right? Does that seem weird? I mean, you wouldn't want me to go do that, would you? And I said, I would not only want you to do that, I'll fund you doing that. And she said, can I gather some other people? I go, only women. <laughs> if any men sign up for this ministry, God did not lead them to that, okay? <laughs> they need the deliverance <laughs> that you're offering. But she said, and we saw ladies who were loved. They would take care packages. They would go and hang out. My wife went several times with them. And uh, we saw ladies that gave their lives to Christ, that left that industry, were baptized at our church, went back to their families, got got better family situations. Sometimes God wants to do big things in odd places. Odd places. I had another gentleman who came to me and uh, been a believer for a long, long time and he rode a motorcycle and he had recently become just a, a club member of the Christian Motorcycle Association and, and he said, Pastor, there's opportunities for us to go to motorcycle rallies and they have church services there and we can engage bikers at these services that will probably never walk through the door of a local church in their community. That seems odd, doesn't it? Like a motorcycle thing, that's weird. I feel like God might want me to do that, but that's odd. Is that, is that something I should do? And I said, not only should you do it, we'll fund you to do it. Because God wants his love and his heart to be shown in all the places where hurting people are. God may sometimes lead you to an odd place. And you may go, well, I don't know that I'm going to any biker clubs or strip clubs. That's, that's fine. But the odd place for you might be your next door neighbor whose dog poops in your yard. <laughs> that might be the odd place God might be leading you. But I can just tell you this. Sometimes your biggest of moments happen in places that you would not have chosen to be, yet God calls you and brings you to an odd place so that he can do a new thing in that odd place. So Mary is at the feet of Jesus. It's an odd moment, odd place. And then there's this funny moment. I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I love to find the humor in it. You know, I can't believe that. The Bible's not funny. Oh, wait for it. It's about to get funny, okay? We're gonna catch back up in verse 40. It says this, but Martha, who was very busy and distracted by the big dinner she was preparing, she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you? Let's pause there and clarify. It already seemed unfair to Martha, but she just wanted to see if it seemed unfair to Jesus. She said, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister is just sitting at your feet while I do all the work? Could you please tell her to get up and come help me? How are you already finding some humor? A little family battle. And I just think a little sibling moment. It's authentic. You know, uh, we're, we're at, at Martha's 
house and Mary's sitting in the street. Let's just be honest. Just from the honesty level, I mean, on most levels, her complaint is legitimate, right? I mean, she's making this big meal. I mean, in fact, she's probably making the equivalent of a Thanksgiving dinner for her sister, her brother, uh, for Jesus, and the dirty dozen. I mean, they're there. They've been traveling. They're filthy, okay? And she's making this dinner, and she's in the kitchen, and Martha's cause was urgent. The dinner had to get done. Somebody had to do it. But one word in that verse, one word stands out as significant. It describes the problem that Jesus is about to address in a very powerful way. And that word is this, distracted. Distracted. He said that Martha was busy and distracted by all the preparations for the dinner. If I could, I'll make another observation about distraction. It's this, your big moments are often missed because of distractions. Our biggest moments where God wants to do something huge in our life is often missed because of distractions. Let's just be honest. In the day we live in, distractions are readily available, right? They're everywhere. In fact, you know, I see people every now and then while I'm I'm driving down the road, I'll look over and there's some lady putting on her makeup while driving down the road at 65 miles an hour. She is distracted. And I'm thinking that little eyelash thing, if you hit the brake, that's going through your eye in your brain. You are done. It's like a self-COVID test, up the nose. I don't know, it's, it's bad. You're distracted. And then somebody who's texting, you know, have you ever been behind that person who's in the, the passing lane, what I call the fast lane, and they're driving 10 miles an hour under the speed limit, and when you finally get around them, you notice they're paying attention to their phone. How many of you pray, Lord, if you want me to put them in the ditch, I'll happy to be your servant right now. I will be your hand and feet extended. I will, I will pray for them as I pass, right? Distractions, they're everywhere. Or at night, maybe you get home and you know, hey, I've, I've done a full day's work. It's time for me to rest, but your head was, won't, your mind won't shut off. There's worry and fear and, and anxiousness about what you left undone. Or it's family time and you can't stop washing the dishes or you can't, finish up with this project out here. You just can't take the time. It's just distractions everywhere. Or church services where you're like, man, that guy's sermon's really not that great. So I'm checking out my Instagram feed as I'm sitting here. And we know who you are. We're tracking you. When you see people walking around in the balcony, they're looking down to see if you're on Instagram. That's what they're doing. Some of you are like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Distractions. So many of our big moments are missed because of distractions. And look at how Jesus addresses it in verse 41. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. Look at verse 42. There is only one thing worth being concerned about, and Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Again, we read it on the page with no emotion, but let's put some emotion in it, okay? This is Martha coming to Jesus. She is frantic, she is passionate, and she says, Jesus, I wanna serve you well. I want to make you a good dinner, but my sister, you know who she is, she's sitting at your feet. Don't look at me that way. You, you, her, she is at your feet, and I'm trying to make a meal, and she's not helping out. She doesn't understand how important this meal is. We got one shot. You're Jesus. Man, we got to get this on point. We got to chop it right. We've got to get it in the oven. The presentation has to be perfect. She doesn't understand Thank you for hearing me. If you could now get her to get up and get away from your feet and get in the kitchen as soon as possible, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. (laughs) How many can feel that message in the verse? And Jesus responds not by saying, you know what, you make a great point. Mary, stop it. Get up and get in the kitchen. I told you I wanted my peach cobbler. Get it made. He doesn't do that. That's not at all what he does. In fact, what he does is, and just go with me here, I can see Jesus kind of getting up from his seat. Mary's standing up. She's pointing and he gets up and walks over and says, shh, it's okay, Mary, or Martha. It's okay. It's okay. Just take a breath. You are so concerned about the dinner and all the details of doing it. But listen, 
I didn't come to your house today to get some of your famous pot roast. That's not what I came for. I didn't come to your house today, Martha, to get your blue ribbon green bean casserole. That is not why I'm here. Martha, think about this. If that's what I wanted, I would have taken the crumbs from your kitchen and turned it into a feast. I didn't come here to get your food, Martha. I came here to spend time with you. I came here to talk with you and be with you. And you want me to correct Mary, but, but Martha, in this moment, it's not Mary that needs to be corrected. Martha, it's, it's you. Because out of all the details you're concerning yourself with, there is only one detail that matters. And that detail is, I am in your house. My presence is here. And if you will focus on that detail, she said, Mary, I'm not gonna take it away from Mary. She's figured it out. She gets it. I'm not gonna ask her to fuss about the details. Instead, Martha, I'm gonna ask you to focus on my presence. Stop focusing on all the busyness of life and focus on my presence. One last observation I see from this moment is this. Your big moments often will happen when you choose to focus on the important, not the urgent. And if you don't know the difference between the important and the urgent, everything will become urgent and the important will never get done. There was a statement made by Seth Godin. He said, if you choose what is important today, you won't deal with as many things that are urgent tomorrow. There's something powerful. And in this moment, Jesus is saying to Martha, Martha, I love you, but you're not getting it. What's most important right now is not the meal. What's most important is that I am in your house. My presence is here. And if you would just take time to focus on me, I'm what's important in this moment. If you would just take time to host me, all this other stuff wouldn't matter anymore. So consider this whole story with me in context now. The whole thing. Martha, not Mary, Martha invites Jesus to their home. And by default, she's saying, I want to host you, Jesus, at my house. Come, bring all the guys. Yeah, bring them. I want to host you at my house. But once Jesus is inside, Martha essentially ignores Jesus. She doesn't spend any time with Jesus. She's so busy doing for Jesus, but misses being with Jesus. And for some of you, that should be something to write down. We can get so busy doing for Jesus that we forget to take time to be with him. But Mary, on the other hand, she simply focused on hosting Jesus in the house. And who does Jesus come in? Who does he say, this is the model of what I want to see? It wasn't Martha in this case, it was Mary. And you might say, why would he defend Mary's cause? Why would he support her? What was in it, what was it about her faith in that moment that made this a big moment for her, it's simple. She knew the difference between the important and the urgent. And she focused on what was important. Maybe another way to say it is this. And this is, if you don't hear anything else I say today, just grab a hold of this one thing because it encompasses the pathway to your big moments with God every day. And it's this. The most important thing that you can focus on every single day is how you host the presence of God. The single most important thing you can do on any given day is to host the presence of God. To be aware that he is there. You see, Martha's the one that invited Jesus, but she didn't host his presence. Mary did. She was the one that got him to the house. And I would just say this. I look at Christianity, and I'm one of them, and I'm not just talking about this church, I'm talking about the global church, and I look at Christianity, and I know so many people have found a place of decision where they say, I, I know I'm a sinner, I need a savior, I want you to be my Lord, and they invite him in, but ultimately, they invite him into their life, but they don't host his presence. Instead, we move into this phase where we say, I'm gonna make sure I, I, I mark off all the things on the Christian checklist, they say I should serve, so I served, check. They say I should give, so I give, check. 
They say I should be reading the Bible, and I, I do it. I don't know what it says, but I read it. Check. And they say that most good Christians have a weird bumper sticker on their car, so I got one of those and slapped it on. Check. I've got like two Christian t-shirts with verses. I don't even know what they mean, but it's on my shirt. Check. And we check off this thing, and don't get me wrong, I, I think it's valid that we have faith practices. Reading the Bible is good. Serving is good. Giving is good. All that is good. But in our doing, which isn't bad, we forget to actually host his presence, to sit at his feet, to listen to his heart, to soak up his healing words, and to follow his daily instruction. We're fine with this idea of going to church, but for some reason when we leave the church, we feel like God stays here. When in reality, we have the opportunity to host his presence every day of our lives. I remember this one. I'd leave my, my grandma's house uh, when I was a kid, and every now and then mom, will dad, mom and dad will do it too, but we'll leave the house and they're standing on the porch. And I think sometimes we think that God's standing at the back door of the church when we leave waving like, hey, have a good week. See you next time. Try not to get in any trouble. And no, he's walking out to the car with like, bro, give me the keys. Why don't you let me drive this week? No, I would like to come with you. Well, but Jesus, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I got some other stuff going on. You don't want to see what's in the trunk. <laughs> Listen, I'm not saying that doing for God is bad. We know that the Bible says faith without works is dead. Right? Our faith should produce in us a desire to do for God, not because it makes us right with God, but because we are celebrating what he's done for us. It's just a natural response. But hosting his presence is such a powerful thing on a daily basis. You may go, what does that mean? What are you talking about? It's, I'd say it's this. It's when we intentionally are aware that he's with us everywhere we go and that we welcome him to have his way in every single moment of our lives. It's that knowledge that he's not standing at the back door waving. He's grabbing his bag and getting in the car with us. He's walking into the grocery store with us. He's sitting in the cubicle with us. He is present. But often he's present and we don't even acknowledge that he's there. But something powerful can happen when we begin to acknowledge his presence around us. I believe it's a big moment. Big moments that God is waiting to facilitate in our lives. What, how do we do that intentionally? I can just tell you some practical ways I've done it in the past. Some is my drive time. So about 25 minutes from work. So often I'll get up early in the morning. I'll leave the house. I'll stop and get coffee somewhere. And then I'll go on to work. And, and when I get in the car in the morning, let me just tell you, when I get in the car at, at 6 in the morning, what I don't need at 6 a.m. is talk radio. I don't need to hear how bad the world is while my day's starting. I need to worship God and be reminded of how good his kingdom still is even after I've slept all night. Amen. And so I've got to say, I'm going to get in the car. And guess what? He's with me. And I'm going to turn some music on. And I'm going to sing a little bit. And I'm going to worship a little bit. And I try to keep my eyes open. I'm driving, but still. And I'm just going to worship a little bit. And something changes. If I just realize if I start my day with him, my moments with him, my embracing and hosting his presence is what's going to make the day any good to begin with. It's what's going to make the difference in that meeting, in that presentation, in that moment, is by starting with that. And then I'll, I'll oftentimes get to work and, and any job, I don't care where you work, at a church, at a factory, at a doctor's office, wherever you are, there are just those days where you're like, I don't care for this job, right? I don't like the atmosphere of it. I don't like what's going on. And oftentimes I'll get into my office and I love my job and I love the people I work with, but some days I'm just like, Ugh, right? And I'll turn on some music and just let it play in the background of my day. Music that honors God and I'll find myself singing or worshiping and then all of a sudden, I'll find people who will randomly stop in the doorway of my, my door. And, and you just kind of sense, they're like, what's going on in here? And the conversations that happen in that doorway are some of the biggest moments I have. Because I've fostered a place where the presence of God can be open and aware and real. And I think other people sense that. 
The presence of God is contagious, draws people in. And I'll have conversations that are life-changing for them and sometimes life-changing for me. Sometimes it's the, in my free time, my downtime, I have a motorcycle, I enjoy to ride just to kind of clear my head. But when I ride, I've got the radio on and I'm, I'm playing music. And as I'm riding, I mean, I'm more aware when I'm on a motorcycle than any other time I'm doing anything. I see everything around me. But you'd be amazed how clearly I see the presence of God while I'm doing that too. And all of a sudden as I'm writing, I'm praying, I'm prayer language, I'm just taking time with God, I'm singing. I bet I pass houses at 65 miles an hour. They hear, ah, ah, I'm just singing, I'm praising God because there's something, any moment of our lives, God is willing to be there, he is there. He just wants to know if we'll host him, if we'll celebrate him. Because it's when we host him and when we celebrate him that we'll get to the end of a day or the end of a week or the end of a month and, and maybe the, in the moment it didn't make sense but we get to that end and we look back and go, wow, God did something this week that I couldn't have orchestrated if I wanted to. God opened a door that I, could, I, didn't, I, didn't, I was just in his presence hosting him and all of a sudden this door opened or this conversation happened or this opportunity presented itself or this, this thing happened in my family that I've been praying for for five years, 10 years. It just happened because when I got a little less focused on the details and trying to figure it out and tried to keep God in my little box and I just said, God, l listen, you've never gotten in my box once. You've always been bigger than my box. Just have your way. I'm gonna celebrate you. I'm gonna be in your presence and be where you are, that's when something powerful, something big. I can't promise you what your big moment will look like. I can't promise you when it will happen. But I can promise you this. If you will celebrate and host the presence of God in every moment of every day of your life, you will look back and go, look at that moment. And look at that moment. And look at that moment. And instead of seeking the moment, seek the God of the moment. Instead of seeking an answer, simply seek him. And in seeking him, something powerful, big, supernatural in the moment will happen for you and I. I love this story. Why? Because it wasn't a king or a queen. It wasn't a person of, of great breed. It was just some common people, everyday people who we talk about today because they did something simple, like host Jesus. And something that they did then, we read now, and we can go, oh, I can have that same experience today if I'll press into him. As you stand all across the room, as we prepare to close in this moment, go ahead and stand with me. And if you would, just bow your heads in this moment. If you're at home, you're watching online, wherever you are, just bow your heads in this moment. And the idea here is simply that you block out all the other distractions. And right now in this moment, I want you to, in your own way, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me right now? What are you saying to me right now? It's very possible there's someone either in this room or watching online that the action step you need to take today is to invite Jesus in, to welcome him. Just like Martha invited Jesus into their house you need to invite Jesus into your life and turn over the controls. And if that's you, wherever you are, in your very own way, right now, just say, Jesus, I surrender my whole life to you. I know I'm a sinner and I need you to forgive me. Help me to walk with you today and every day. Amen, with your head still bowed. If you said that prayer today, you made the greatest decision of your life. And I challenge you, tell someone today, tell someone who's sitting next to you, tell a friend that's in this room, or even come tell me or one of the staff pastors who they would love to hear because you just made a great decision. But I'd say today, I think I shared this early on, the impact of this message today is not based on the person who delivered it. The real impact of this message today is based on how the people who heard it respond to it. And so my challenge is simply this. Maybe today during this message, you were challenged with God's asking you to do something that, that seems odd at first and you've just been pushing back. God's been asking you to do something that's kind of in an odd place and you've been pushing back. Maybe you've 
been distracted by a lot of stuff and it's getting in the way of your relationship with God. Or maybe you've just gotten too focused on the urgent and not very focused on the important. But in it all, maybe you're here today and you say at least one part of this message today, it struck a chord in me, something needs to change and I'm gonna respond to that and, and do something today. If that's you, just lift a hand right up and right back down. It's not for me, it's for you to acknowledge that something needs to change. And this is what I want us to do all together in this room right now. We're gonna invite the presence of God to not only infiltrate our lives right here, but to be aware to us out there and that we will begin to host his presence in a new way and that he will give us the strength and courage to live the life he wants us to live and to have big God moments in public everywhere we go. Let's pray. Father, we just take a moment and we say thank you for the opportunity that we've had in this moment to allow your word to to kind of cultivate something new in our hearts, to, to break up some hardened places and to shine a spotlight in areas where something needs to change. And God, many in this room raised a hand and said, this, it struck me one way or another and something needs to change. And so, God, this is our declaration. Come on, church, pray with me. This is our declaration. This is our declaration that we want to live and walk in your presence. We want to host your presence like never before. We want to be more aware of the fact that you are with us every single day. God, make us aware today that you're not standing at the back door waving goodbye to us as we leave this building, but you are going with us everywhere we go, in our workplace, where we live, uh, in our community, in the store that we're in. God, you're there with us. And how we host your presence in that moment, how we worship you, how we acknowledge you, how we celebrate you could be the defining moment of whether or not that big moment with you will happen. And so God, we're ready for big moments. You created us for big moments. And God, we know that begins by acknowledging and knowing that you are with us and hosting your presence. And so all across this room, Lord, we say, Jesus, come in our week and have your way you're welcome to mess up our plans. You're welcome to, me welcome to mess up our theories. You're welcome to mess up the way we think things should be. And we invite you to have your way in our lives. And we are claiming by faith big moments that show the world we serve a living and powerful and loving God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thanks for being here. Have a great week. Hey, thanks for joining Faith Community Online today. If you're new here or you made the decision to follow Jesus, we would love to connect with you and let you know how to take your next steps. Real quick, text NEW TO FAITH to 97000 and someone from our team will get in touch with you soon. You can also visit our website at faithcommunity.co to learn more about the church and stay in touch on social media. Shoot us a DM over on Facebook or Instagram if you have any questions. And hey, share this message with a friend. And if you have something going on in your life that you would like someone to pray with you about, please send a quick email to prayer at faithcommunity.co. Someone from our team would love to pray with you about whatever is going on in your life. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next time.